Good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. My, my name is Ross Smith. I'm director of tests for the uh, Microsoft Link team in Office. And I'm going to talk a bit today about uh, some work that we've done with um, gaming in the workplace to, to what we call productivity games, the idea of building um, game mechanics, game elements, not gamification, um, into the workplace so that the, the act of playing the game will, uh, will actually get work done. We've, had, we've been doing this for uh, seven or eight years now, uh, started in Windows, and, and so I'll have a couple examples here, but just kind of share some of the lessons we've learned, um, you know, both positively and negatively, and with a little luck, I'll be able to use this. Um, there we go. So just a little bit about, so I'm on the, I'm the director of tests, so our job is QA testing is uh, is about improving the quality of the software, and and it's a it's a it's a job where diversity really matters. Um, you know, the the tenth bug is harder to find than the first one. So if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you you train the software to pass your test, but you don't improve necessarily improve the quality. So the, both diversity of of technique and diversity of user is very important. And so where we found tremendous success in games is uh, to encourage broad uh, beta usage of the, of the product that requires some effort from our user and, and may you know, inflict some temporary discomfort on them in, in return for feedback. So the use of game mechanics, gaming principles to encourage beta user participation is, uh, has been very effective for us. So um, going back a few thousand years, uh, the uh, Great Pyramid at Giza, uh, there's the stones on, on either side, these big, you know, huge, massive stones that were hauled up by the, by the Egyptians, um, contain similar markings on each side of the stone. And what, what it turned out, and I was, had the great fortune of actually being at a conference with some Egyptologists and asking this question, is they actually competed, to uh, the teams of, of workers competed to haul the stones up the pyramid. And so they had uh, the friends of Menkari and the, and the celebrants, or they call it, of Menkari. And the two teams competed, and very similarly to you know, how uh, teams compete today, the, the prize at the end of the day was a beer fest. Um, so very interesting that the use of games to get work done goes back a long time. So when we think about today, fast forward to 2011, the type of employee that, that uh, is entering the workforce, and this is not just in software, but just in general, has a very different set of skills and, and sort of technology savvy that, uh, that has changed. And so a lot of times the processes that we use, uh, you know, we haven't incorporated, okay, how does Web 2.0 influence, you know, software development or uh, the ability to text? A lot of the things that are very commonplace outside of the work uh, are not necessarily incorporated in the day-to-day -day work. And so... How do, you know, how do we change the way we communicate? How, how do we change the, the way we employ sort of uh, openness and sharing that, that are very commonplace outside work, but not necessarily the way we work inside? And so, I'm going to kill this little thing here, sorry. Um, so, one of the things in, in, you know, in joining a new team, I'll, I'll go around and do sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with each person on the team. And... A very common theme with, with newer employees is uh, underutilization. Like I have all these, these skills that I've, that I've honed either through a, a higher, you know, higher degree of education or um, a uh, just pervasiveness in social networking or, or whatever uh, that can't be consumed by the way we, the way we do work. And, and Gallup does a, a survey every year on employee engagement. And basically the numbers pretty much similar every year, show that about 70% of employees are at least somewhat disengaged, and that the actively disengaged, uh, which in, you know, run usually 10 to, between 10 and 18%, uh, cost 300 billion a year in lost productivity. So we felt that this was an interesting um, challenge to try and address, not necessarily in the disengagement, but in the underutilization, like how do we, how do we tap into that? And so we, um, we kind of wrapped a, a bunch of different things up in, in this initiative we call 42 Projects, which really has sort of three pillars. It's the idea of collaborative play and fun with games at work, uh, the idea of building organizational trust. There's a, uh, a great study done a few years ago by a couple of researchers from the University of British Columbia who had uh, equated organizational trust to uh, pay in terms of how satisfied people were in their jobs. And 
So they basically said the, a 10% increase in trust felt the same as a 36% pay raise. So our first attempt with 42 projects was, okay, let's go for the pay raise. That, we didn't get that, we settled on trust. And so um, really looking at games as a proxy for building trust. So in a, in a low trust environment, a game can encourage that, that diversity of behavior that, uh, that we find so productive in, in what we do. And then finally, how do we innovate in the way we manage to better accommodate the, the new generation? So thinking about specifically now on games, or what we call productivity games, games at work, um, that, that games are a great way to improve communication. Uh, you think about the, you know, any sort of game outside of work, you know exactly what's going on, you, you know exactly what to do, you're engaged you know, with good game design and, and um, you know, the various principles and mechanics of, of gaming. You, you know exactly how you're doing. You, you know how to improve, you know what to do to sort of level up or power up. Um, and then using them at work really gives us the opportunity to, uh, to save money and to be more productive. And if you think about what, what gamers want in a good game, it, it's really what, what we'd all like as, as employees. And that's, you know, we want it to be fair. When I, when I do something, I earn points, I get instant feedback. Um, it's very transparent how to get ahead. If, you know, I can figure out, I can try things, I can experiment. I can take risks um, and learn get, and improve, and I, and I know through my score that I've improved. And so, really, gamers want what employees want, and employees want what gamers want. So there's a very nice match in motivation around the use of games at work. So this is kind of, if, if there's one piece to, to kind of take away from this, this, this matrix is um, what we kind of put together in terms of uh, where games at work are, can be successful and where, and where they're not. And, and this comes from um, having both results. And so uh, if you look at sort of the, the three columns, um, core work skills, unique skills, and, and future skills. And basically core skills are things that everybody has. So maybe the ability to type, or for us, the ability to program in a, in a certain language. Uh, it might be you know, the ability to speak a language something that a, lar a large percentage of the population has. The unique skills are the, are the ones that I'm being paid for, um, something that I bring to the organization that are unique to me that I can offer. And then future or um, expanding my skills are things that I can learn to do better at my job. So I might learn a new language, I might learn to type faster, um, but something new that I can uh, that I can do to improve. And then the two rows are sort of my in-role behaviors or in-job behaviors. Those are the things I do every day that I'm paid for. And then the organizational citizenship behaviors, which are things that I can do to improve the organization, but are not necessarily part of my job. So uh, I may help a neighbor, right, and, and answer a question for a coworker. I'm cleaning the coffee pot at the end of the day. Um, things that will make it a better place to work that aren't really included in the in the day-to-day -day job. And so what we've seen is these two areas really work well. Um, the future work skills and for my in-role behavior, learning a new, a new skill or a new technique, that's sort of the games for education area. And, um, and then the, the very interesting one where we've had the most success is these organizational citizenship behaviors uh, for core skills. So, um, and I'll go through a couple examples here, but just to talk about some, some lessons learned uh, in areas that don't work. If I look at that center, uh, that center column for unique skills and my in-role in behavior, my in-job behavior. Um, so if we create a game that is the do Ross's job game and we play it for a month and I come in eighth, um, I may have a weird conversation with my manager after that because I'm not sure, or they might not be sure why I came in eighth at my own job. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> so it, it, it's confusing to me and they, the flip side is, okay, if I came in first at my job, does that mean, will I get to keep my job or do I get a raise or a promotion? There's, there's, you're confusing um, points with paycheck. And so I show up, am I playing the game or, or am I trying to earn my, earn my paycheck? And a, a lot of, I think, a lot of the early introduction of, of games at work go in this area. Hey, we need this job done faster or something like that. So let's, uh, let's, focus on these unique skills in, in job behavior, you know, make more widgets faster and faster, which is it, it's offering sort of a secondary extrinsic reward. We heard a lot this morning on intrinsic versus extrinsic. And, um, and so we've had several uh, um, 
let's say, lessons learned in, in where that doesn't work. And, and similarly, beneath that, the citizenship behaviors for unique skills, if we say, okay, we need, uh, um, you know, to apply Ross's ability to speak Slovakian to a project, and I'm the only one, because it's a unique skill for me, well, then just ask me to do it. You don't have to build a big, a big game for a small target audience. So, so there you really don't have many players. So the key area is that, that lower left, uh, that, that lower left square with uh, core skills and, and citizenship behavior. So I'll talk about um, a few examples. And really, you know, what we're trying to do is sort of recapture that discretionary time at work. I, you know, I'm sitting at my desk eating lunch and playing solitaire. Uh, instead of that, maybe I could be playing a game to help out the organization. So that's really where we're, we're trying, to, trying to target and, uh, and improve productivity. So the first example I'll talk about is, uh, is in localization testing. Some of you may work with software and be familiar, but um, just a, a brief overview, it's, there's, a, there's a sort of an economic benefit to uh, localizing software for different languages. So if, you know, I use it in English and then maybe Spanish and, and so on and so on. And for Windows, uh, which was where we wanted to target, this is a, a massively hard, large-scale problem. Um, there's Windows ships in a hundred languages and there are thousands of strings. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a big challenge to kind of go through and make sure every, every screen gets, uh, every string or screen gets translated correctly and then also is assessed to be sort of geopolitically correct. And so um, it's something that you, you really, the cost of getting something wrong could be, could be very significant. So there's a lot of effort that goes into it. And so we came up with the creatively named uh, language quality game, uh, which is a very simplistic, and this is probably an example of one of our most uh, um, elegant games, is that the, the, the nice, sort of benefit we have of, of games at work is we don't have to do a big elaborate, you know, 3D animated shoot 'em up um, massively produced uh, video game, console game, but we can do very simplistic stuff because the alternative is much, you know, for this one, for example, I'll show you here in a second, we, uh, um, there's, there's a shot of the game, and really, it's, you're reviewing these dialogues with the strings in the dialogue. So the, what we're competing with in this game is I hand you a stack of printouts with, with dialogue images on it and a pen and say, would you please find any errors, which um, you might get through two or three, but you, you lose interest pretty quickly. So a very simple animated game like this had, has tremendous results. And so really what we wanted to do here was target native language speakers uh, within Microsoft to contribute to the to the assessing the quality of the of the dialogues and the strings, and we found um, I kind of jumped to the I'll just jump right to the results here uh, that might be hard to read but we had um, over 4,000 players from around the company and uh, had 500,000 screens reviewed and what we found was the level of engagement for uh, native language speakers around the world was. Uh, was fantastic. Typically, they would they would install a version of Windows, which is you know takes some time, and um, and then kind of go through and try and find the different dialogues and, and and report issues as they found them. This allowed us complete coverage. We had sort of back-end algorithms that allowed us to make sure each screen had appropriate number of views and coverage by by particular language. And a lot of times, it, it sort of it touched on that intrinsic motivation that hey, this is this is a version or an addition of Windows that's going to go back home to my family and friends or relatives. So I want to make sure that it's of high quality. So there was a higher level of engagement early in the, in the process. And um, the level of participation in some of the uh, regional subsidiaries was close to 100% of, of the smaller subsidiaries. So we really got great coverage and we were able to uh, um, really improve the quality of, of the language results for Windows 7. And then um, the next one, well, it wasn't quite the next one, but the most recent one we did was last fall uh, where we really, and, and again, a lot of talk on extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation, and we were really trying to see what we could do to tap into that. We've looked at sort of for, for productivity games, the important thing uh, is that people keep playing. The more players you have, the, the more they're playing, the more work is getting done. So it's, it's really important to build elements of, of uh, various types of motivational um, 
game mechanics in, in each area. So we look at you know player versus player, the, the, the glory and shame of the leaderboard. And, and then player versus self, can you beat your high score? Can you do this so many days in a row? And then player versus environment, so puzzle type games. We're really trying to appeal to everyone. But, but we still felt we were, we were mostly focused extrinsically. And we were trying to kind of come up with some ideas. And so what we, what we put together last fall was a uh, game for Office Communicator was the name of the time, and Communicate Hope, which was sort of a benefit for disaster relief. So the, the, uh, we sent out to about 20,000 people around Microsoft, and um, the, uh, they would play and, and exercise our software, either look for issues or give us feedback on usability, and, and sort of engage with us on, on how they, uh, what they thought about the product. And they would then earn points that they could uh, contribute to various charities, um, or they would pick a charity to play for, and then and then do some some beta testing essentially. Uh, and we had teams and and uh, individual teams and individuals. Teams could sponsor certain scenarios, and so that allowed us to use um, sort of instrumentation metrics from our uh, test process and sort of direct. Um, player behavior. So if we needed coverage in a certain area, we could use uh, game mechanics and points and, and uh, badges and things to drive activity into, into those certain areas. And the, um, the results there were, were spectacular. We, the first game we did, we, uh, early on, we saw about a 4x four, four improvement in player versus non-player. And in this case, we saw really like a, a year over year, probably a 16 percent or 16 time, 16 X increase in participation from players versus non-players. And, and we had in the, in the feedback that we got, uh, about 70% of the people who had signed up and were actively playing the game engaged with us and gave us feedback versus 3% of the non-gamers. And so it's just some real spectacular results. Um, and then at the end of the, at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the beta period, we made a large donation, a portion to, to all five of the charities we used, a portion by the number of points that people had earned. So it was a really a win-win, and people had a really positive experience with, you know, and our software is, um, you know, web conferencing, audio conferencing, and so the cost of a failure, um, while as a, you know, while we're receiving beta feedback, a failure is great, right? But for someone using the product, they, their, their phone call drops, and it's not so great. So. By, by, by enabling sort of um, an altruistic mode for the gameplay really took a lot of that out and, and was, was really, really helpful in, in delivering a high quality product. So uh, just briefly here on, on a few others, um, the Elevation of Privilege game is actually a, a physical card game and uh, there's, a, there's a process called a uh, threat model where you kind of model attacks against a, a service or a, a website. And uh, Adam Shostak from the from the Windows or from the security team had uh, had put together an, a, a game based on the game of Hearts, the card game of Hearts, where players can sit around a table and sort of uh, design um, threats against a component against a system. And the outcome of the gameplay is actually the threat model. So, which is a it's a, it's a very um, typically a very lengthy and difficult task to produce because you really got to brainstorm a lot of different methods. And this card game gives, sort of gives people sparks on, on what to think about and how to attack it and then sort of gets the competitive juices flowing. And so you end up with, with great threat models coming out, a very simple, cool concept. And then some of you may have seen uh, Ribbon Hero and now there's Ribbon Hero 2, which is a, uh, it's a downloadable game. You can go to officelabs.com, and it's, a, it's an add-on to Office that allows you to learn, to play the game to learn uh, how to better use Office and be more productive. And so a great, uh, a great little um, sort of engagement piece to, to find different ways to, you know, format documents or create slides. And I, I don't know if you can see in the upper right there, but... Um, if you have it installed, you know, like as I'm doing slides and things like that, I'll, it'll just fire off and say, oh, you just, you know, used the Times, Roman, Times New Roman font for the 20th time or something to get three points. But it's an interesting way to kind of keep engaged. And, and it, it falls in that, in that matrix. It falls in the upper right as a sort of an um, in-role, like skills that I can learn to be better at my job and uh, a very useful download. 
So finishing up here with, uh, with some guidelines, some lessons that we've learned over time. The, uh, really start out with, with knowing exactly what behavior you want to change um, or, or, or create, engage people with. The, the, one of the problems is, is if, you're, if the game is vague, people will do some stuff and then they'll kind of lose interest and you may not get the, the results that you want. So start with some clear objectives. We have found that prizes usually aren't necessary, that uh, if, with, with good game design and, and good thought about what uh, behaviors are rewarded. Because the problem you have is that if it takes me, you know, two minutes to perform a task to earn a point, and it takes someone else 10 minutes to, to do that same task, from the, from the recipients, you know, from the team hosting the game or, to, or after the certain behavioral change, you really want both people to keep playing, right? But if all of a sudden, I, you know, I, I win a mountain bike because it takes me, I'm five times as fast as everybody else, then everyone else is gonna stop playing. But if you don't have rewards and, or you use player versus self uh, motivating techniques, you can keep everybody moving along and playing. So rewards tend to, tend to not go well. Um, keep the duration of the game short. Uh, you, you find that you may find exchange rates on effort uh, are different in that example, or you may find that, oh, somebody has a lab and they can do all this automatically. And so you, you really want to, you don't want to change the, change the rules in the middle of the game, so you keep the game short and then you, you launch another one later on. Um, and then again, sort of focus on that, the, those citizenship behaviors. And then what we found is the role of sort of a game master, uh, someone who can answer questions and keep the community engaged is, uh, is very important and very helpful. And a little bit on developing. Um, you know, I, I would imagine most of you work with R or work with game designers, and that's sort of that whole right-hand right side there. And then what's interesting for productivity games is you also sort of need the corporate developer type who can engage with your HR systems, um, large, you know, production type databases of some instrumentation data or process data, because that's where you get your points. And what we found is if you have, uh, if you have a, an objective or a behavior that you want to change to increase the productivity of some group of people, you probably already have all the data you need for scoring and points and, and the, the game elements because that's important data to your, to your business process. So, so really just kind of bolting on um, some game design around the, the existing corporate data is, uh, is a very useful way to, and, and rapid way to sort of get games into the workplace. And so just some, a couple of just f final recommendations. I think I touched on most of these, but um, keep, do a lot of small experiments and keep track of lessons learned. The, the, that's really stay, the, the temptation is, oh, we need this to happen faster. We need more people to do this. Let's put a game on it. And that doesn't work. It's that, that competition with the paycheck uh, ha usually does more harm than good. And so uh, really think about how to, how to Think about citizenship, and if there's an area where you need more productivity, you need more coverage, you need more something, think about people other than the, the people who are already working in that area. Think about recruiting others to play a game to help. Um, I, I, the, I always think about the, the Netflix prize and the person who had the job developing the algorithm before the Netflix prize, and how they, I, I'd be curious on what they felt about you know, someone else winning a million dollars for their job. And so that's, that's sort of the danger of, of sort of those uh, unique skills type games. And so um, really just try, experiment. Uh, the, the role of the game master hopefully can get feedback from the players to say, hey, this feels kind of weird, I'm not sure, or hey, this is great, or you know, have you considered this? So you get a lot of engagement from people. And so the Mary Beth, who I started with, is actually a real, real employee. And when we began this, um, you know, it was, I, I feel underutilized and, and, you know, at the conclusion it was like, it doesn't feel like work anymore. And uh, it really drives engagement, it drives um, fun, creativity, laughter in the hallways. It's, uh, it's a very easy, simple way to, um, to create sort of employee engagement and retention and all the things you want sort of from, from a productive organization. So a couple, just a couple quotes here, um, but Gary Hamble, the, 
as an author who's wrote, written about the future of management, uh, we need to create work environments that are immersive and as involving as the best video games. And I really think if you think of the workplace of the future, it's a natural that the gamer generation, as they, as they grow up in the workplace, it's a natural that we're going to have games at work. And so um, I think it's something that, uh, that we can all, it's sort of a, this industry that can, um, can really drive some of that. And then uh, finally, that's, that's what I have. And I'd like to thank you for your time. And um, if anyone has any questions. Crystal clear? <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much for your time. <clears throat> and the uh, 42projects.org has a bunch of references if you're, if you're interested. Thanks very much. <laughs>